Nityanandam Paramasagadam Kevalam Nyanamurtim Dhanvati Tam Gaganashadasham Tadvamasya Rilakshim Egam Nityam Vimalam Chalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavati Tam Triguna Rahitam Sadgurum Tam Namami Nityanandam Hi, this is Manitya Ovyananda and today we have another part in the series of the Living Enlightenment Jivan Mukti book. Today I'm going to talk about sannyas. Uh, I've talked about sannyas many times already, but from the standpoint of this amazing book, Living Enlightenment, which Swamiji again reiterated yesterday during the book's anniversary, uh, he reiterated, reiterated again how powerful this book is and how important this book is. He suggested that everybody reads this book for one year, for 21 minutes a day, and you can become enlightened. So again, I will put the link in the comment field of this video. So please, get your own copy, download it on your computer or tablet or phone, and read it. You'll really... Uh, you'll really enjoy and benefit from this book. So today I want to talk about samsar and sannyas. Samsar literally means the world or the path. It basically refers to the worldly life. So the endless cycle of birth and death. You know, you're going to have married life, you're going to live in the world, in the material world, and uh, you know, have all the luxuries and whatever things that you want. Or uh, the way of sannyas. So there's basically two ways to move, either with baggage and people or by yourself. Uh, so that's the biggest difference. So in the first case you might have to wait a longer time. Uh, and then in the uh, second case you can reach this very minute. Uh, so you know if you think about it you're with a spouse and your family. And you might evolve or spiritually grow or get on some path. But if your spouse is not on the same path, it's very difficult, right, to move ahead. Because you you want to bring them with you, but they don't want to or they're not ready. But yet then you're being held back because you need to go back to their, their level or their uh, process wherever they are. So blessed are people who actually have a relationship with somebody who's also a seeker. But... Uh, I've seen it's pretty rare. There's some few couples, amazing couples that I've seen uh, that are together working towards enlightenment with one another. Uh, but typically, uh, it's a little bit of a rocky road from what I can tell. So I'd rather take the path with less baggage and by myself. Thank you. Uh, anyhow, there's a beautiful story. Uh, see, sannyas is the decision to not carry any baggage while moving. You can have everything, but you don't need to carry it because when you're a sannyasi, you decide that existence will provide everything needed. So everything you need at that moment will come. Uh, there's a great story somebody puts in here regarding uh, from the life of Buddha. So I'll read it out. Uh, it's, it's a nice story. Okay, Buddha's disciples gathered around him one day and asked him to teach the essence of sannyas. He told them a small story. One man was living on an island by himself. Suddenly he got the feeling it was time to move from the island. He did not have a boat, so he made one with whatever he could find, some twigs, branches, leaves. It was a difficult journey, but somehow he crossed and reached the other side. Buddha asked the disciples, after reaching the other side, should the man keep the boat or discard it? The disciples came out with different answers. Buddha continued, the man of sannyas discards the boat, knowing that he will be provided for as needed in the future. The man of samsar keeps it so that his effort doesn't go to waste, and if he wants to journey back. So you see in that story, it illustrates the difference. Um, so the sannyasi walks with his thoughts on existence, and the samsari walks with his thoughts on how to exist. There's a difference. There's more of a freedom and an unclutching uh, to just rely on existence, to understand that existence is providing. Instead of going through the stress of wondering how are you going to provide for yourself, how are you going to provide for your family. Because in a way you get stuck in, uh, I feel like a mental, logical game 
where it's a catch-22, you know. You, you have to provide for the family, so you have to work and make the money. And then what if you're stuck in a job you don't like? But you have to stay there and you can't follow your heart because you have to provide for your family. So then you have to work and have a job no matter what. So you have to put anything on hold that you might want to do or your heart's telling you or something you want to seek or if you want to get on a spiritual path. So if you see, that's kind of everyday life for people. And when I was on that sort of path of doing those things, it drove me nuts because I'm like, what is the point? You know, it's not like I was ever like a lazy type of person, you know, because believe me, being a sannyasi is not for lazy people. In fact, you know, a typical night of sleep is three hours. But since for so many years now, and I'm as fit as a fiddle, but people wouldn't believe that you can live healthily and energetically off of so little sleep. That's just one small example. But the energy that Swamiji gives us, you know, sustains us. And there's so much to do. You know, our life is so full. Uh, but anyhow, when I was in that life, you know, I just couldn't see the point of it. And then actually I would get kind of depressed about it at times. Because I'm like, what is the point of all this? I'm going to work. I don't even like my job. But it's making decent money. I'm able to have a house, which, you know, everybody's saying you should have. You should have an investment at least. So then I got mature and I decided, okay, let's buy a house uh, so that I can, you know, have an investment. You know, but then it's like I'm locked into the, paying this thing for 30 years. And what if I want to do something else? I can't because I'm stuck with this house. If something breaks down or the roof falls down or who knows what happens, you know, then what? It just didn't make any sense to me to go to a work that you didn't like. Then just to pay the bills. Just to make it by in life. Where's the time for other things? Where's the time for creativity or for doing other things? You have some precious little time on the weekend. And at night, hardly any time. Because you go home and you cook and clean and get all the things ready for the next day. And by then you have hardly any time left. And I remember even uh, when I started following Swamiji, and even I was a little goofy back then, I would maybe sleep five, six hours. So that's still not that much compared to what many people get. Maybe on the weekends I would take a little more, take a nap or something. But I somehow, every morning, I was always like, God, why don't I go to bed earlier? And every night I would be like, oh, but I want to do this one more thing. <laughs> so even then, I, you know, it was always like a kind of thing with me to try to get to sleep earlier and get some rest. But I always find something more to do. Anyhow, um, so it's hard for people to believe and understand that you can live out such little sleep. But it is a big difference in lifestyle, you know? We have the support of the Sun God. You're continuously in the mode and mindset of completion, of getting into oneness. How can we break our logic and stop using our brain as normal and get into the oneness space? I'm still myself working on it because I really was a, a lot more of a logical person than I thought. I always thought logic was for people who were like doctors or business people and, um, you know, I don't know, I had a certain like stereotype of what I thought a logical person was. I always thought I was more creative and artsy, but my mind is so logical, it's like, you know, and if I didn't meet Swamiji, man, I don't know where I'd be today, I'll tell you such a crazy thought current I had, you know, then. But anyway, that, that'll be a story for another time. So back to the samsar versus sannyas. So walking always with your thoughts on existence. I mean, we're always walking with our thoughts on Swamiji. What would Swamiji do? What is he teaching us? How can we get out of this emotional uh, jail? Like if we get into some low mood or we get into some incompletion, you know, what is Swamiji telling us to do? How can we break that? How can we be powerful and act from a powerful space instead of going into incompletion and powerlessness? And then it really doesn't do anything good for any situation. So how do we do that? And especially, you know, and I notice sometimes when I say, what would Swamiji do? Wow. You know, it really puts you into... Like sometimes it's even hard to do or you you don't even want to do it because 
Swami Ji like would do always the best and for us it seems so hard at times so always trying to get into the space and how he would handle things because we can't say we don't know what he would do because most of the times intuitively we know what he would do but we don't want to because it seems too hard for us so Swami Ji is such a I don't know there's no good words to describe him in the, in the English language He's so much bigger than we can imagine. And he tells us how the difference that uh, an incarnation has over a regular person is that an incarnation also decides to be big, bigger than life, bigger than what you can imagine, bigger than what you know. An incarnation makes that decision. See, we're always trying to be in that cozy little thing that we know. We're afraid to be bigger than we are because we don't know what's there, what's out there. And that seems a little funny, doesn't it? Why wouldn't we want to be the best we can be? If Swamiji is telling us we're Sadashiva, it seems too much for us. It's an interesting thing. You have to contemplate a little bit. He's saying that we are God. We are divine beings. But why is it so hard? Why is it easier for us to respond when somebody says, ah, you're nothing or you're a jerk? I mean, you might you know, want to fight with them or something. But it's easier to take that you're a lower person than a god. So what Swamiji tries to do with us, he has such an infinite patience, patience. What he does with us is through the initiation into various different methods and things he's given us, and not methods, but actual powers he's given, from the time of Kundalini awakening to healing to Vak City to all the things he's given us, and now with manifesting all the Shaktis, he just he wants us to understand and have a glimpse of that and understanding that we are more, that we are connected with the divine. He wants us to experience it firsthand because it's so important. It's such a you know, and imagine he really goes out there because so many people are criticizing him or criticizing even using your third eye. These yo yo's will think they'll know that there's a third eye. You know, they'll have maybe read about it in scriptures or heard somebody or spoke to somebody or maybe even experienced something on their own. I'm talking about these fake gurus. But they're telling people, don't use it. Oh my God, don't open it up. Imagine, they don't, I mean, they're clueless. And Swamiji is really going out on a limb because he, he believes in what he's doing and he knows what he's doing is right. People have a right. People have a third eye. It's like telling someone to keep your eyes closed and walk around. Why would you do that? It's your right to open your eyes and use them. You were given them as a gift. And, and thank God we have working eyes. You know, if you don't, you know how it might be. So then imagine not allowing your third eye to be open. It's part of everybody. Everybody has it. So such a thing he has to go through, all these yo-yos criticizing him, and all the negative idiots in the media, you know, these anti-Hindu and anti-spiritual elements. I mean, come on, you know? Get out of your lower self-esteem and your lack of uh, love for anything. Because if you understood what, where Swamiji was coming from, that space of compassion, completion, and wanting to give whatever he has and whatever he's experienced, you would understand what a terrible crime you're doing by interfering with his work and what he's doing. But I digress. I mean, how can I not? such a topic that we can talk for it for some time but as a sannyasi we're in tune with Swamiji he's our guide he's our light he's our Sadashiva so always being in tune with him in his space as much as we can as much as we can remember and go beyond that it's like you really need to be focused on it all the time and that is the benefit one of the many benefits of being a sannyasi because we don't have to have our attention diverted with anything else we only have to think about him how can we do what he's telling us? How can we use his techniques, his teachings, his initiations? How can we live like him continuously 24-7? I know that my thoughts are there on him in some way or another. So without that, without that, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. So I'm very grateful for this uh, life as a sannyasi. And if you're not married or have never been married, please consider this as a life path for yourself. 
Anyhow, we're over our time for today. But thanks very much for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Good day,